what is up guys back with another video and today we're going to be looking at the fungal pneumonias so in this video we're not going to be covering all of the the different uh, fun fungi that can basically be present in systemic disease but we're going to specifically look at the fungi that can cause uh, pneumonias or particularly kind of focus more on the respiratory tract now in these uh, in these uh, fungal infections you can see that a lot of times they can go what's called disseminated or that just means that they can kind of spread throughout the body if they were to get into the bloodstream etc but in for in most cases in mild cases they particularly are linked mainly to pneumonia type symptoms and causing pneumonia so let's move right into this this is the basics of fungal pneumonia that you kind of have to have a general knowledge before you move into these topics and as usual as we get into the different uh, causes of fungal pneumonia, I'm going to have mnemonics for every one of them that I've developed to help keep everything simple. So the first thing you need to know is that these cause a slow onset pneumonia in most cases. So you'll have a very slow onset of pneumonia. It won't be anything too really life-threatening or severe unless, unless you were to be maybe immunocompromised, such as having HIV or you had a bone marrow transplant or whatever, so you were taking medication. Those are more of the cases where you would have disseminated situations of these uh, fungal pneumonias we're going to be covering. The next thing is that the, the, the fungi is consumed in spore form. So in, almost, in all of these, you're going to see that I really shouldn't even use the word consume because in the next point you're going to see that these are inhaled. So the way that you get all of these fungal pneumonias we're going to talk about is you inhale their spores. And a spore form of a fungi is basically a form that's kind of, they kind of lay latent and they're kind of in a protected form. This is called a spore form. And they're a little bit more resistant to uh, things like starvation and whatnot. That, that's what's called a spore. And so when they go in these spore forms to kind of protect themselves. So you take in all of these, the, all of, for all the fungal pneumonias, you take, you take them in via inhalation through the lungs and you take it in the spore form. Now, depending on the fungal pneumonia we're talking about, uh, some of them will go, well, actually the majority of them will go from a spore form into what's called a yeast. So it goes out of its latent form and then it enters into its single cell, just normal form where it's active and a little bit more vulnerable to starvation and whatnot and where it would need more nutrients in what's called a yeast. So a yeast is just a word for a single celled, uh, fungal organism, basically that's exited out of its spore form, its latent form. Then the multi-celled group, so that just means, okay, now we have a single cell called a yeast, a single fungal cell. When it begins to divide and produce more, kind of like a colony, this is called mold. And another name here could be mushrooms, but this is kind of the more common in, in referring to fungal pneumonias. So the treatment is same for all of these. You can give flucon fluconazole or itraconazole if it's localized, and that'll be the majority of situations in non-immunocompromised patients. And then you give the big guns, amphotericin B, if it spreads throughout the body or if it's disseminated. And then also you need to know fungal pneumonias are not contagious. It's not like somebody has a fungal pneumonia and then you can spread it to somebody else. It's not contagious in that way. The only way that the, another person would be able to get, say, the same fungal pneumonia you had is if they were in the same spot where you inhaled those spores of these fungal pneumonias. All right, so those are the basics of fungal pneumonias. Now, these are the four main types we're going to talk about. Histoplasmosis, blastomycosis, coccidioidomycosis, and then paracoccidioidomycosis. Okay, now remember, on all of my videos, you're going to notice I love mnemonics because I cannot keep all of these hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of facts straight in medicine. So this is the mnemonic I've developed for histoplasmosis. So the first thing you need to know is that histoplasmosis, the common region that you'll often see this in is the Mississippi, Ohio River Valley area. So if, if you know, I'm making this really simple. This is the USA. It's kind of in this sort of region right here. So we're talking about really it kind of extends over here. So we're talking about like Illinois, Indiana, uh, maybe uh, southern parts of Michigan, that kind of area. So this upper kind of northeastern, but not actually not northeastern. It's more of a central kind of north central part of the United States. And they'll often tell you a lot of times that the patient was near the Mississippi River or the Ohio River Valley, or they'll give you a state like Illinois, Indiana. Another thing that's not on this slide, and I want to add it, I should have actually put this as a bullet point. How you typically get this is from 
um, bat or bird feces. And so typically what happens is you'll have patients that'll say that they were in a cave exploring or something like that. So caves is a very common place you can get this. You can also get this if you're in a maybe may say New York City and there's a lot of pigeons and you were exposed in it say in a certain situation like you're a bird handler or you were exposed to a lot of pigeons and you must have been a lot of, around a lot of uh, bird feces or bat feces. That can also happen that way. Now, so those are kind of the two just kind of details that you probably already knew about. You probably heard of histoplasmosis taught plenty of times in medical school. This is where the mnemonic comes in as far as I want to remind you what I said on the first kind of fundamental slide when I talk, was just talking in general about fungal pneumonias. The first thing you need to know is that all, all of these, all the fungal pneumonias cause a mild pneumonia, a kind of a slow onset mild pneumonia. Now that's before dissemination. But there are certain unique characteristics that each one of these cause. I'm going to cover the unique characteristics in the mnemonic for every, every one of these. So, What's the mnemonic for histoplasmosis as far as some of the unique characteristics and symptoms you could see in a patient that is having histoplasmosis that can help you differentiate histo that it's histoplasmosis versus some of the other ones? Well, in every one of these mnemonics, we're going to use the first letter of the word. We're going to make this really simple. So histoplasmosis starts with an H. We're going to use the mnemonic for H. All of these start with an H. So we, the first one is called whole. Now, I'm really referring to this word. You ever heard somebody say like there's a whole lot of something? The whole or something, the whole of something as far as in this spelling means the entirety of something. So, or all of something. So I use that to kind of just imagine there's a W here to help. The reason I pointed this out is because I just spelled it like that just to go with our mnemonic. So the first, the first part of the mnemonic is there's a whole group of cells affected. What do I mean by that? I mean that this is very, there's a very unique symptom that can happen, especially in disseminated situations of histoplasmosis, where a patient can get pancytopenia. So it begins to affect the bone marrow and you, and pan, the pancytopenia just means that you have a decrease in all blood cell types. You have a decrease in red, red blood cells. You have a decrease in white blood cells, etc. So all of your all of your cells will be down. Okay. Now the next part of the mnemonic, hiss H for hiss. Imagine a snake that is hissing. Or I, you know, me personally, I love the series Harry Potter. So I think of um, the Slytherin and how they're often associated with snakes and snakes do this hissing thing where they're, when they're, say they're mad or there's, or whatever, just being normal, they'll hiss. Hissing is involved with the tongue and the mouth. So there's something very kind of unique about this particular uh, type of fungal pneumonia in that it causes oral mucosal ulcers. It also can cause tongue mucosal ulcers. But that's still part of your mouth. That's still considered oral. But I just want to emphasize that. So you could see ulcers on the tongue or just kind of around the mouth, inside the mouth. This is called oral mucosal ulcers. I have put oral in red because in one of the other ones you're going to see there's also can be mucosal ulcers, but it's not going to be limited to the mouth. You will more, you then can see in that other example we're going to talk about that in that fungal pneumonia, you can see mucosal ulcers in the throat. You can see mucosal ulcers at the larynx. You can see mucosal ulcers, um, in the nasal, kind of in the, in the nose. So all of, so that's a key differentiation. When you see just only oral mucosal ulcer, ulcers, in the case of a suspected fungal pneumonia, really start to think about histoplasmosis. So we've covered the fact that you have a whole group of cells affected. That starts with an H, so pancytopenia. We've covered the H for hiss. That's think of a snake hissing. And snakes hiss using their tongue, which should help you remember the mouth, that the mouth is involved. So oral mucosal ulcers or tongue mucosal ulcers. The last H is going to be hepatosplenomegaly. This is fairly common in histoplasmosis that's been disseminated that you'll often see a large liver and a large spleen. So these three things, now you'll say, well, there's a lot more symptoms. I'm aware there's a lot more symptoms, but I'm trying to point out these unique things that can help you differentiate in clinic or on a, on a test to help you kind of lean towards, okay, this must be histoplasmosis versus any of the other fungal pneumonias. So key things you need to remember. Being around uh, bat or bird feces, so typically a patient who has been exploring in caves, 
This is common in the Mississippi and Ohio River Valley areas of the United States of America. So think Illinois, uh, Michigan, kind of lower New York, all that kind of stuff, or Pennsylvania, parts of Pennsylvania. So, and then our mnemonic goes then from there, then you do, you use the first letter H to remember a whole group of cells are affected, pancytopenia, hissing, which will help you remember oral mucosal ulcers, and then hepatosplenomegaly, which is going to um, be for a large liver and a large spleen. Okay, so that's histoplasmosis, the key features. The next one, blastomycoses. So blastomycoses, we're going to have a very similar mnemonic. The first letter is B, and we're going to have unique characteristics with a B. All right, so where is this one found? The same exact location. But I'm going to emphasize something here. I've seen in a lot of resources that they just say, oh, it's the same as, like, say this one, histoplasmosis. But I want to emphasize that this can also happen at the Mississippi uh, River Valley. This can also happen near the Ohio River Valley. But they add in Great Lakes. And if you know anything about U.S. geography, the Great Lakes are far north. So in, in histoplasmosis, it was more in just this area, kind of this area of the United States, you know, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and all that. In this particular example, we're moving way far up to North Michigan, Wisconsin, kind of out where the Great Lakes are, okay? So in this particular one, it's the same exact space kind of area that's common in histoplasmosis, except it, it also adds in this more north part near the Great, Great Lakes. So they, they will also, they will often tell you in a question, uh, great somebody that was near the Great Lakes area, northern Michigan, etc. Okay, now the mnemonic, blastomycosis. The mnemonic gives you the characteristic of how the how the fungi will look if it were to be cultured and looked at under a microscope. So, B, the letter B, because it's the first letter of blastomycosis, stands for broad-based budding yeast. That means that when it were, when the yeast itself, remember what yeast means, yeast is just telling you that it's a single-celled uh, fungal cell that's come out of its spore form. So you inhale the spore, right? And then this spore enters into its active state, but it's still a single-celled um, organism. So this is um, just going to be now called a yeast. So this was a spore over here. Then what happens is as it begins to divide, it has a very odd thing it does when it divides. When it divides, it will kind of, as it divides, it will stay close to one another when it buds off. What's called broad-based budding yeast because the base itself is very considered broad when you look at the two cells that are very close to each other. In most situations, when you have a budding of, of fungi, they're more spread out like this. In this particular situation, you're having what's called broad-based Broad-based budding yeast, broad-based. And that's just telling you that it's very broad because the two cells are practically connected together. And you'll see that when you look at it under microscope. So all of this, this entire part of this, everything starts with a B. You see blastomycosis, think broad-based budding yeast. See, all with a B. So that's a characteristic feature. Now they may not, they may tell you this in a question or they may show you a culture and the culture will have these yeast cells that are budding and they'll basically, it'll look like they're attached still. Like it's almost, it looks like it's incomplete uh, separation into two. So that's called broad-based budding yeast. The next one, B for bone. This one, when, when, especially when disseminated, is very common to cause osteomyelitis. So B for bone, osteomyelitis. And then I think of this. The last thing, the title of blastomycosis, just look at that the word blast is in it at the beginning. If you were to think of just underneath the skin that you had a mini little blast, almost like a mini bomb went off under your skin, you would poke out the skin, right? So that helps me remember blast to the skin, which also starts with the B and is in the beginning of the word, is going to help you remember that in this one you can have these verrucous warts. Verrucous warts. So when you look at warts, oftentimes you see they're elevated like that. And it, you can almost imagine that a little mini blast has gone off from underneath the skin. And so in this, you can have these warts that commonly appear um, in disseminated situations of blastomycosis and naturally along with the localized infection of the uh, fungal pneumonia that you would see as well. So don't just think, oh, where's all the pneumonia symptoms and all this? All of these have pneumonia symptoms. 
So the flu-like symptoms, uh, pneumonia-like symptoms, they're all present. I'm only going over the unique characteristics, okay? So that, so we've seen in the, in this mnemonic, the letter B, B for broad-based budding, B for bone, to hint towards that this, you can commonly have osteomyelitis in disseminated situations of blastomycosis, and then B for blast to the skin, or you could say blast under the skin. That should help you remember that you can have skin manifestations, especially verruca warts. Okay, the next one, co coccidioidomycosis. This is common in Southwest USA. So think places like California, Arizona, because they're, they're thinking that the primary place that this usually originates from is Mexico. So then naturally the states near Mexico, California, Arizona, New Mexico, all of those is where it's very common along with Mexico. So they could give you an immigrant that came from Mexico and, you know, presents with symptoms that you're really suspecting a fungal pneumonia, really be thinking of coccidioidomycosis. The mnemonic, again, is using the first letter, the letter C. C for California. That's going to help you remember that this is in the southwest U.S., the southwest. So all the states I mentioned up here. And remember that it's originating really more so in Mexico. C for clusters of endospores from spores only. Now, let me explain this. In the previous fungal pneumonias we talked about, I said that you inhale the spore. The spore then leaves its latent form once inhaled and turns into its yeast form, which is the single celled. And then it can then divide and whatnot. And then once it starts dividing, um, you can get colonies called molds, right? Or mushrooms you'll see sometimes as well. So this is the spore, which is the latent kind of more inactive form that protects itself from starvation and lack of nutrients and whatnot, almost like it's waiting for its its host to kind of, you know, sap nutrients from them almost. And then um, it goes into its active form, which is still, it has not divided yet. And that is going to be called a yeast. And then from there, it goes into many of them. And that's called a mold, right? When you have a cluster, a bunch of the cells that have divided. Now, there's something very special about coccidioidomycosis here. You have clusters, and you would expect it would be clusters of a bunch of yeast cells, which would then be called a mold. That doesn't happen. Not only does that not happen, you don't even get to the yeast stage. This particular, this particular uh, fungus stays in the spore form. So you have the initial spore, and then the spore itself can branch off endospores. So instead of making, um, I'm sorry, it would not branch off. Let me not use that. This is a better description. It's more or less inside, kind of all packed in to the spore. So it sends out all of these endospores. So instead of producing other cells, it stays in the spore form and then makes endosporms, endospores that replicate. And it's these spores so that are actually causing the effect. So it never really reaches, it never really kind of enters into the yeast to the mold stage. Okay. It just kind of keeps producing more spores from the initial spore. All right. So we remember when we look at C, we think of these clusters of endospores from the spore only, right? And then the next thing, C for calves. There's something called erythema nodosum. Erythema nodosum is just an inflamed fat, the inflamed fatty tissue. So the inflamed fatty tissue um, underneath like your shin area or sometimes your calf area, but typically it's the shins. So when you see a person, here's a person standing here. I'm bad at drawing, sorry. So when you see a person standing here, you have, say this is their knee, right? Typically right, kind of right below the knee, this area is called your shin area. And you'll have these, you'll have these like red, big red areas and these big it almost looks like a bunch of kind of reddish bruises almost and this is called erythema nodosum and it's just inflamed fatty tissue underneath uh, the skin at the location of the shin or the calf area because your calf would be then in the back but typically it's more or less uh, more kind of in the shin area so that area right underneath the knee and inferior to the patella bone so the C stands for calves. That should help you remember you're having this uh, you're having this presentation of erythema nodosum at the calves, and that's very common in disseminated situations of the, of coccidioidomycosis. The last thing is C for cracking, and I think of an elderly person with a little cane 
who's say it's a a little old lady who's 70 some years old and she has arthritis osteoarthritis and you think every time she moves you hear her bones kind of cracking and rubbing together so c for cracking bones or joints that helps me remember that arthralgias are very common um, in coccidioidomycosis now this kind of all of these features together this arthritis that you can see commonly presenting this erythema nodosum uh, and then along with the fever and the typical flu-like symptoms this is something called you'll often see it called desert fever and the reason it's called desert fever is because this area of the united states that it's located in the southwest usa and mexico area it has features very much like a desert it's very hot and dry and so these features are called desert fever because of where the fungus uh, typically originates from. Okay, so that's coccidioidomycosis. The last, this is the last one uh, for the fungal pneumonias, paracoccidioidomycosis. So don't mix up coccidioidomycosis with paracoccidioidomycosis. And it's and so it starts with a P, and that's going to be our mnemonic again. A P is pretty much going to cover, just like in one of the other ones we talked about, the P is going to cover how it's going to present on a, when, it's, when it's looked at under a microscope. So the first thing you need to know is that when you look at this uh, fungus under the microscope, it's going to re resemble when the mother cell begins to bud and replicate, the cells do this thing when they, when they make their daughter cells kind of around it. They kind of stay almost connected at its periphery, but it's not just like in the situation of broad-based budding where you have this and this and just kind of one cell of them kind of staying connected. It's the fact that you have this pirate wheel or pilot wheel appearance because you have a mother cell budding and giving off multiple children cells, but yet it's happening on all sides of it. And so you'll see this common kind of presentation on a um, when you look at it under the microscope. And this is called what's called a pirate wheel or a pilot wheel appearance. You also see it sometimes called a Mickey Mouse appearance, I guess because they're saying that Mickey Mouse has big ears like this. But um, this is a little bit more common of them to describe the appearance. And because you have all of these, these little uh, multiple children cells around still kind of attached uh, to all, or all around the border of this initial uh, mother cell that's been budding off from it. This is called the pirate wheel or pilot wheel appearance. Now, notice pirate wheel, pilot, they all start with a P. You can imagine how that's going to be used in our mnemonic because it starts with a P. This is common in Central and South America. How do you remember this? Because there's two ways. I've resorted to just learn this. PA, because there's an A there, kind of helps me lean towards it too. PA for Panama, like Panama Canal or just the country of Panama. I'm not talking about in Florida. I'm talking about uh, Panama, the country. Panama is kind of that, like where that little bridge is. That bridge is kind of central from South America. And so that gives the exact location of where typically uh, people who get this fungal infection come from and where uh, they typically will come from or where they are residing, Central or South America. And I remember that because it starts with a P, and so I think of Panama Canal location. If you don't like that and you say it's going to be hard to remember Panama uh, from that or you can't think of where Panama is located in the world, you can remember this, P4 peripheral or like the periphery of the U.S., so I think that, okay, what's the periphery of the United States of America? It's the other, it's the other areas that's kind of farther away from it, kind of neighboring it or adjacent. So then it helps me remember, okay, we're not talking about North America. We're talking about Central and South America. So you can remember it either way. P for Panama Canal, which I use, uh, I prefer, or P for periphery of the United States. And that'll help you remember. Either one should help you get to Central South America as the typical location. The last thing is very important here pharyngeal mucosal ulcers. Do you remember when we were talking about histoplasmosis? I said that part of the mnemonic for histoplasmosis, remember because the mnemonic is the letter H for what it starts with, is hiss, like a snake. And I said that is going to relate to mouth ulcers. Now when I was studying this, I got very confused because I went to some medical resources and I read, oh, well, there's also mucosal ulcers in paracoccidioidomycosis. And they were saying in the medical literature that it's fairly unique for histoplasmosis to be the only one that typically causes just the mouth ulcers. And then I looked closely because I saw paracoccidioidomycosis and it also has mucosal ulcers. But the mucosal ulcers can be pharyngeal 
And I'm also going to reiterate more from just that. So they can be in your throat, which would be pharynx. They can be at your larynx farther down. And then they can also be even in your nose, right? So any of those they can be in. So yeah, I mean, maybe they could be some in the mouth, but when you see that extension of the mucosal ulcers, maybe you see find some in their nose, maybe you find some in their larynx or their throat or wherever it may be, that should hint you towards the, okay, maybe we're not talking about histoplasmosis as much because histoplasmosis is more specific for the most part to uh, the mouth and the tongue. Okay. So those are kind of, that's a characteristic, unique symbol, uh, symptom of paracoccidial mycosis, especially in disseminated situations. Of course, along with the flu-like symptoms and, and the mild pneumonia, slow onset pneumonia that you see in all of the fungal pneumonias. Okay. So that is the video on fungal pneumonia, uh, pneumonia, uh, pneumonia. And if it helps you in any sort of way, please like, subscribe, share, and I will see you in another video. Uh, bye guys.